Hello and welcome to Smash Hit Sports. I'm your host, Cody. Nick and I are going to do probably the greatest college football playoff preview you've ever seen. I, I, I don't think it, I think that's probably an understatement, actually. It's going to be outstanding. Um, we are right in the middle of bowl season. Um, we're currently watching Rutgers in Miami right now. Um, Nick, how, how do we feel so far? Like we just had Christmas. Like are, are the vibes pretty high still? The uh, vibes are definitely teetering, uh, sometimes <laughs> high, sometimes pretty low. I just feel like, and we, we were just talking about this, but there, there's been a lot of, uh, you know, third string quarterbacks playing in these games, a lot of rain, a lot of like last second opt outs where for you and I, when we're kind of like predicting this stuff, we, we do it before the first game starts, you know, like March Madness yeah. style. Yeah. Like imagine in March Madness if in the round of 32, the third point guard on the roster is like playing and then like the two big men decide they're not playing and you have them going all the way. It just, it, it's been annoying because I, I did, yeah. you know, obviously put money on this aside from our bull pick em, um, you know, because I, I believe in my picks and it's just not working out. And Miami just lost to Rutgers because they were playing a third string quarterback who did not look very good. Um, so yeah, I'm 12 and 15 now, which is not great. Um, but you, I mean, you started out pretty hot. Yeah, yeah, I started out real hot. Kind of, kind of fizzled yesterday, but um, uh, we'll see how it goes. Did you watch the USC Louisville game last night? Yeah. Holy yeah. shit! Miller Moss, baby. Miller time, baby. Um, what a what an absolutely insane performance. And we talked last week about, you know, how weird it was that Malachi Nelson was transferring. Um, it kind of seemed like an odd thing. Five-star yeah. guy was going to have the keys to the kingdom. Uh, maybe Miller Moss is the reason, yeah, <laughs> the reason the why. I, yeah, that, I, damn, what a game, dude. I do think that I read that somewhere. Like someone said, like, oh, I'm pretty sure Malachi actually, like, lost the the backup job or whatever to some random guy. And I was like, what? Um, but, yeah, I mean, talk about a third-string quarterback that actually went off. He was throwing darts out there. I mean, it felt like the USC we saw with Caleb Williams last year, uh, where it was just the offense was getting whatever they wanted. I think it might be time to talk about Louisville being one of the most overrated teams of the season yeah. all year long. So. I mean, we talked about this going into a, a long, long time ago in our ACC prediction. Louisville's schedule was so fucking easy. So it easy. was so easy. Like, even their difficult games, like they got Notre Dame at home off a of bye. Like, there were a lot yeah. of things that lined up for this Louisville team. They ended up losing to Kentucky, who wasn't outstanding in the SEC this year. Like, maybe – I think Louisville maybe was a little bit overrated. and They lost the pit. <laughs> yeah. That should yeah. have been the telltale sign for us because the only the, – the problem is they, like, were coming off of that Notre Dame win, right? Yep. And so that was still too fresh in our heads where we're like, well, Notre Dame's this, like, top 15 team. Yep. You know, Louisville looked so good against them with Jawar Jordan kind of having a breakout game at running back. Like, Jack Plummer, okay, Louisville's maybe legit. But if that didn't happen, you know, or if that happened, like, week two and then they go get smoked by Pitt in week seven – I think we all would have said, like, wait a second, Louisville actually stinks. So yeah, we just attribute it to like, ah, uh, well, whatever. It was one of those games where like they were looking ahead or like still hyped from the Notre Dame win and and whatever. But yeah, and the other thing about this USC win that was super impressive, outside of Moss going for three seventy two and six, their defense looked pretty solid. Like their yes, defense looked okay. Did. They blocked that punt at the in the first half that like. Was they were trying, huge... Cody. Yeah. They looked it... like they were trying, which was a beautiful sight to see. Um, again, I, I had USC winning this game all across the board in every one of my pickums, Money, you know, money line on, on you know, DraftKings and all that. Um, and... I bet that was pretty juicy. That was probably plus 200 plus. Oh, 100%. Yeah, it was like plus yeah. 185 when I, okay, when yeah. I bet it. Um, and But I remember when I was like, like after the Malachi Nelson – transfer news we were talking i was like i really wish i could change that but like i can't because the graphics out i already placed about all this stuff and so it was a really pleasant surprise to see this amount of effort i mean if you watched um like all of louisville's touchdowns were 
pretty much like third and goal from like the two yard line after a couple stops by USC in which like the Louisville running back, it changed a bunch of times. He would like barely get across, like have to like dive. Like it felt like in the trenches, USC was actually winning the battle there for the first time in a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, that's what uh, two months without Alex Grinch can do to your defense. I mean, it's game changing. All right. Next game. um, Did you watch it? It was late. But the Kansas um, UNLV, what well, what bowl game was that? Guaranteed rape uh, bowl. We had the name of it. Uh, yeah, it was, it was the guaranteed, the guaranteed rape, rape bowl. Rate, yeah, yeah, that game was outstanding. It was a nine o'clock kickoff, super late, and I'm like, I'm I'm pumped. I was like, hey, look, I ain't got to work tomorrow. This game's gonna be awesome. I'm watching it. It was outstanding. Barry Odom yeah. and Lance Leipold, like they put on a goddamn show. Jason Bean, that dude went nuts. I think this he- is what this is what we were saying. Kansas has a fucking a crop of quarterbacks on that roster that yep. are all so good. It's exactly why we both went with Kansas. Um, it, he, I mean, four hundred fifty yards, six touchdowns. Yeah. On 19 completions. Yeah, dude, that's the <laughs> insane thing. Is like there were there was like one dude who's like four for 160 and three touchdowns. Like four catches for yeah, 160. It was that's insane. The Randy Moss stat line. Yeah, they had two and, wide and, receivers with three touchdowns apiece. Yeah, which is nuts. I mean, it it was such an electric offensive game, and, and then of course there were five interceptions thrown as well. Yeah. So it just felt like when you play Madden on. Like, what's the – there's, like, the arcade mode, I yep, think. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it felt like that where it's like, okay, if you're going to, you know, beat the wide receiver, that's a touchdown. If you're not, it's an interception. Um, and it was it was electric. I completely agree. Um, I mean, yeah, at, at first I was like, oh, UNLV looks like they might be here to play. And then Kansas in the second quarter is, like, balling out. I'm like, okay, it's over. And then UNLV to start the second half – completely Come, dominant yeah in Kansas at the end it and high scoring game it was great fun to watch the penalties in that game were insane they set a bull record for the most penalties in the game i i think there was like five minutes left in the third quarter kansas had like 15 penalties it, it was yeah. absolutely insane it, yeah. like if it was like in the nfl where they do a spot foul for um pass interference, pass interference in, right. instead of just 15 yards they would add 200 yards of penalties like no seriously it was, yeah, it was, it was like a like chuck it up and the the defensive backs yeah. were so helpless <laughs> it was, that they were just desperately either interfering or uh letting up touchdowns and then sometimes intercepting it so yeah the game um, the games with no punts are just the best it, it was yeah. absolutely outstanding um, and then another bowl game I wanted to talk about Northwestern beating Utah 14 to seven, not an exciting game. Nothing happened like a very, a very run of the mill game for the most part. But the fact that we are sitting here, I predicted Northwestern to go one and 11 this year. Yeah. I they think went I, I might eight, have them going winless. They went eight and five with a bowl win over Utah, who was like a yeah. good team in a good pack 12. That's insane to me what david what, braun has done is not going to get talked about enough just absolutely no, unbelievable not. i mean what utah probably ended eight and five as well right i'm uh, guessing because I, I think they had four losses so. um yeah they did Give it a quick, um, yep. but if yeah if you at the beginning of the season told me that northwestern and utah were going to finish with the same record but northwestern would have the head-to-head tiebreaker <laughs> I, I mean, I would have been like, go to jail, dude, like for that. That's, yeah, defamation of logic. But it happened. And, uh, yeah, David Braun, I mean, Northwestern, maybe they're just like, maybe we're going to see them be top in the Big Ten, you know, standings. So, uh, okay. Let, let's pull the bricks a little like, bit. But you like, know how crazy that sounds? They're not, <laughs> you are not going into the week against Northwestern next year assuming that your team's going to win unless you're like Ohio state or Michigan. But like outside of that, like you're going to have to play a good football game, which is good. Like that's good for the big 10. Yeah. This, this week, like the little bit post Christmas, pre Christmas bowls 
are just proof that bowl games are fucking awesome. And anybody who says, oh, we should have less bowl games can go kick rocks. Like they've, there's been some awesome football to watch. There has. And it's like giving a lot of these lesser known players like a, a chance to shine yeah. under the you know biggest lights. Um, the only complaint that I have, again, is that I'm losing money because <laughs> there aren't enough of the good players playing. And that's the only complaint I have is that I remember, you know, back in 2014, 15, whatever, like just picking, plucking a random game out of the air would be like Louisville, Florida playing in the Outback Bowl with like Teddy Bridgewater and Jeff Driscoll as the quarterbacks. Yeah. Of course, they are not opting out and they're about to both go into the draft. The entire, like Jeff Demps at running back, like everyone on those teams was playing in a bowl game that we're seeing third stringers playing. Um, and so it's just less like, Ooh, this like really is juicy, but we are getting really fun football. And I do like it for the players that are getting to play. So you bring up a phenomenal point and Lane Kiffin discussed this. And I want to talk about this quickly before we go into the pick em update and the playoff preview. Lane Kiffin brought up that, and this is kind of crazy, especially considering Ole Miss has dominated the the transfer portal. But he said college football is the only sport in which free agency happens while the previous season is still going on. Yeah, and that's, I, I, wow. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true because you have guys like the transfer portal opened up like what first week of December or something like that, essentially right after um, conference championship week guys have stopped playing football for like maybe a week. A lot of these guys, not at all because they're going into the bowl games. Right. And then they're making decisions off of current rosters and how like that's, that's crazy to me. Yeah. I I think what needs to happen if I were to fix the college, because a lot of people are saying the transfer portal is ruining college football. Here's how I would fix it. Just make the transfer portal one extended period post the national title game. Yeah. That gives a lot of these guys who have been in bowl games, who have been in the grind. Like I played college football, not D1, but I fucking played. College football is a grind. You get into camp in August. You are in that locker room every single day for months on end. Like it, it is a grind, even when your team's good. And especially when, like, maybe you don't get the playing time you want. Your season's not, like, gone as maybe your team sucks. It is what it is. Like, those things happen, <clears throat> right? For every winner, like, there is a loser. And then you make these decisions immediately after the season's over when you're exhausted, you're tired, you're emotional. And I think a lot of these guys wouldn't enter the transfer portal if they had, you know, a week or two or a month or two to think about it. Right? Yeah. You have guys, Drew Pine and and Tyler Buckner, Notre Dame's quarterbacks from last season, transferred out. Pine went to Arizona State. Buckner went to Alabama. Both of those, both of those guys are transferring back to Notre Dame. Yeah. You know how crazy that is? Like, yeah. I bet in hindsight, you probably wouldn't have left. Buck, Buckner right. might get a ring, so maybe maybe he still would have left. But, like, do you think Drew Pine would have left to Arizona State to not start and then to come back to Notre Dame? I think he probably would have just stayed, you know? Like, it, it's – Yeah, it, think about, like, the the academic uh, drop-off from going from Notre Dame to Arizona State. Like, yeah. really, if you're going to ever make that decision, it is strictly a football decision. Exactly. And, like, you want and, a Notre Dame degree. Like, that is a fi- – like – obviously I'm a Notre Dame fan toot my own horn, but like that does kind of mean something, you know? I mean, it's definitely better than an Arizona state degree, Arizona state. What? I mean, there's like a hundred thousand undergrad students every year. Yeah. Like they don't decline anyone from that school. Whereas Notre Dame's got like a 15% yeah. acceptance rate. And yeah, if you're going to transfer that, that means you're like, I think I'm going to get the starting job, but it shouldn't be like a, I think, or I hope it should be, you know, the head coach of Arizona state is like, we're like, you are, we're going to give it to you. We want you. Right. And yeah. it happens in like mid March, you know, yep. you, you transfer out. Like it, it could happen. It does not need to happen December 3rd, the day that the transfer portal opens. I completely agree with that. 
And it, it, I mean, obviously, we still have opt outs. Um, yeah. As far as like the NFL draft goes. But I think that would happen less, too, if you transfer after, right? Like, guys would want to play in the bowl game, especially, like, for example, Sam Hartman, he's done, right? It, say Notre Dame's quarterback, Steve Angeli, were to an- enter the transfer portal, or Malachi Nelson were to enter the transfer portal. If that portal doesn't open up until after the bowl games, then maybe Nelson plays in the bowl game. You get to see him on film against an actual team and an actual defense before you enter the transfer portal it gives it because right now if you're accepting that guy you're basing it off a high school film because you have no idea what the fuck he is in college like yeah you get a chance to see that especially like that's what i would really want to see for like you get guys with another chance to put tape on film in these bowl games that now matter a little bit more if that transfer window is just january 3rd Right. Or, you know what I mean? Even if it, or whatever the the January 7th is the college football playoff that still allows the portal to be like open prior to the academic year. Right. For the, so you can transfer, you can get your academic stuff situated at your new school. You finish out your first semester. Like to me, that just makes so much more sense, but I, who knows? I'm just a, yeah. There, it is, it's computer. funny with college football it seems like there's always something that needs to be fixed um because now that the 12 team playoff is yep. you know happening it's like okay we you know a lot of things are getting fixed this talent disparity this competitive balance seems like it's getting fixed but now it's like well let's we need to you know maybe fix the uh the postseason just the logic of it all doesn't make sense so i completely agree with that um and it, you, like you said it is funny that lane kiffin is you know yeah, getting all these transfers in and is the one to say it, but that yeah. just shows me that he's he realizes it and yeah. is willing to adjust to it better than anyone else has so far. Well, and uh, like these guys so are trying to, off. if you're Lane Kiffin, like you now have to deal with talking with recruits and, or not recruits, but like guys who are on other teams to try to get them to come in. National Signing Day is in December. You had to deal with talking to all these recruits. Oh, also you got to play for a fucking game against Penn state. Like yeah. that, you know what I mean? Like, Hey, maybe we, maybe we push that off a little bit. Um, I think, it, I think it would benefit literally everyone involved. Um, ro- rolling into the pick them update. So we have a top two, um, this now, this is before the Miami Rutgers game went final. Um, but the top two is roll on you bears 12 at 19 and seven. Um, and then the geo Ramo at 18 and eight, there is a huge clusterfuck of people in third place. So, but shout out to those two guys. Um, I hope you're listening because y'all are, y'all are hey football, big football brain. Um, I'm currently sitting at 24th at 16 and 11. Nick, you are 76th at 12 and 15. Now that may have changed a little bit since the Miami Rutgers game, whatever, but probably did. Yep. Probably did. Um, so I fell from fourth to 24th and, uh, you're going up. So, Hey, I am. Hey, all things pointed North. Uh, yes. Well, all things were pointing North. And then I've lost, I was 12 and 12 actually last night when I was looking at it right before that Oklahoma state Texas yep. AM game went final. And I was in like the 60th percentile. I was like, hold on here, guys. Like, don't count out Nikki Picks quite yet. Uh, but then I've lost, now. <laughs> I've lost three straight, um, which is just, I mean, the fact that Boston College beat SMU. That, that by, game, like, that game towed me. Yeah, like I was so unbelievably confident that if we're just doing money line, like that's a freebie. I'm yeah. getting SMU right. But no, of course not. And that's just because it was a run dominant game. And Boston College has a run running, a great running quarterback. Yeah. Because it was pouring rain. uh, Because all these bowl games are rainy and it's brutal. I don't know if you watched Virginia Tech Tulane. That was, that game was a clusterfuck. There were fumbles everywhere. Like, that was a monsoon, right? Yeah. It was like the announcers would be like, yeah, like ball security's been an issue here. Hopefully, we don't see any more fumbles. (laughs) And then as he finishes the sentence, there's a fumble, like return for a touchdown. I'm like, oh my god. Yeah, it's just sloppy yeah. when it's rainy. I don't know. So, um, yeah, we'll see. Um, you you definitely have a chance to to win still, but I, I do think that I'm probably, I have I I need a miracle at this point. Yeah, 
Yeah. Yep. We'll, we'll see how she goes. Um, all right. So let's get into the game previews. The first game is Michigan, Alabama in the Rose bowl. Um, should be an awesome, awesome game. Five o'clock kickoff. Um, the line for this game, Michigan is a one and a half point favorite. Bama is plus one Oh two on the money line. Uh, the total is 45. Um, as far as injuries go, Zach Zinter was hurt. I don't know if that was the Big Ten championship game or maybe it was the game against Ohio State where he yeah, messed up his knee. Yeah, uh, it was against, it was against OSU. Okay, um, but he's out. Um, and then Alabama, Jace McClellan is listed as questionable with a foot injury. He is their leading rusher. My assumption is that he's going to play. Um, but that's just what, um, you know, the, the website had for as far as injuries go. So, Nick. Tell me, tell, like, what are your thoughts on this matchup? Because I'm very excited for this game. Yeah. Um, I've definitely, we've had a lot of time to think about this matchup by now, right? And I'm, I'm glad we're kind of previewing this later as close as we could to it actually happening. Uh, because my thoughts have really been, like, my gut reaction was, surely this has to be Michigan's time. Like, it just has to be, because they've been really bad against the sec like they just can't figure out how to beat them they you know have made the playoffs a couple times and lost they should not have lost to tcu now they're actually the one seed you know they're playing a bama team that in my opinion is not as good as people are currently assuming like people are saying they beat georgia they're hot right now they're like if you can beat georgia that means you're like the team to beat right where it's like I don't think Georgia was as good as people think they were this year. I, I'm pretty sure Alabama has, like, the worst rushing defense that they've had in their previous eight seasons. They were used to seeing them have, like, Deron Payne and uh, Jonathan Allen and all these guys up front. Like, but they, they don't have as many names, like, as you – like, you a casual fan probably yeah. would be able to name, like, none of them. Um, and, and as far as Michigan goes, you know – do I think JJ McCarthy is going to put on a show passing the ball? Probably not. Um, Alabama with like two single, uh, two high safeties and like the cover seven look they normally do um, is, is going to make it hard. But as far as running the ball, I really don't think Michigan's going to have any problems and that's what they're really good at. So like, I'm just not as afraid as, of Alabama as it seems like some people are. Um, and I could eat my words there because this is, SEC versus Big Ten, maybe maybe Alabama just is way better and the Big Ten was pretty bad this year. But um, I, I just feel like this has to be Michigan's turn, at least to make it to um, the national championship. Yeah, Despite we're that. sitting in a, re- in a really weird spot with Michigan because Alabama was tested. Very, very assuredly, they were tested. They played the Heisman winner in Jaden Daniels. They played um, another college football playoff team in Texas at home, and they lost that game. They were losing or tied at halftime to US, USF, UAB? USF. USF, yeah. USF, right? Like they were in situations this year in which they weren't comfortable. Michigan the game. was. Yeah, the Auburn game. I mean, fourth and thirty-one. You you had a, a, a prayer, and they won yeah. that game. So Auburn or Alabama, Auburn, ew, gross. Um, Alabama has shown that they have been vulnerable. Michigan has not at all. They have not like outside of the Ohio State game, which was a a great game, a lot of good back and forth. But even then, it didn't feel like they were ever pressed. So the question to me is. Is Michigan that calm, cool, and collected where they will not be stressed at all? Or have they just not been stressed because of the teams that they've played? And I don't know the answer to that question. And I think we're going to find out very quickly. Because this this game is going to be, as much as you know, we love offense and we love, like, you can name a lot of Michigan offensive guys and, like, you can name a lot of Alabama offensive guys. The defense is going to be what separates these two teams. Mm-hmm. Michigan's defense has been nothing short of outstanding all year. And you can say what you want, that they haven't played good competition. Their efficiency metrics are still, like, top five all over the place. So I get that it's like, oh, yeah, they played Iowa's offense doesn't fucking matter. They've still shut, shut them down. Um, 
and then Alabama, on the other hand, like Alabama's defensive unit has been really fucking good and they've created turnovers, created plays when they needed to. Now is Dallas, like you said, is Dallas Turner, Will Anderson? No, he's not, but he's still pretty damn good. Right. Like he is. obviously they don't have a Minka Fitzpatrick at safety, but their safeties are still pretty damn good. So the secondary not... is good. Like Kool-Aid is good. Dallas Turner, I would say is, is more of a, he's a pass rusher, right? Like I don't think yep. he's much of a, a run defender uh, type guy. So I, I really do think that they have a good passing defense. I just mm-hmm. am not sure about the run defense, but go on. Yeah. And, and that's, that's really where this matchup gets interesting, right? Obviously Zinter's hurt. Even with that, Michigan still has one of, if not the best, I'm going to say a top three offensive line in college football. I I don't think it's really like super debatable. If Michigan is going to win this game, it starts with those five guys. Like you have to, you have to win up front. Michigan runs a ton of 12 personnel there. What they do offensively out of 12 personnel is going to be a, a huge key to this game. Their tight ends are really fucking good. They don't have like the, Brock Bowers esque stats that like you know you see when you evaluate NFL tight ends, but these guys are really talented. They're going to cause mayhem in the middle of that defense. Uh, what are how if you are Michigan, like how do you attack this Alabama defense? Because JJ McCarthy hasn't thrown for 150 yards in four straight games. Yeah, and again they didn't have Harbaugh for. You know, three a good of those, chunk four. Of those yeah. games, right? And and you, as you saw, they ran the ball like eighty percent of the time. I mean, like to, when you run twelve personnel for the people that don't really know what that is, it's when you have two tight ends in pretty much every it's every package with two wide receivers and then one running back. You know, in college, obviously, it's normally yeah. a pistol formation because people hate getting under center in college, but. When you have two tight ends on the line of scrimmage, what that does is it gives you seven offense alignment pretty much. And Michigan's tight ends are really good at blocking. Um, so, it, and, and and when you establish the run as well as Michigan does, it opens up those tight ends to run, you know, into the flats for some play action dump downs, you know, kind of just getting small little chunk. Like, I really don't think this is going to be like we saw in the TCU game last year where it was like, you know – the the 80 yard touchdown followed up by like a three play drive for Michigan, blah, blah, blah. I think that if Michigan's going to win, they're just going to get five yards on first down running another three, a play action dump down to the tight end, maybe a slant to Roman Wilson and just methodically, you know, manage the clock and score touchdowns. Cause they also like are really disciplined. They don't have a lot Mm -hmm. of penalties. They don't turn over the ball really at all. Um, and so if they can like control the clock like that, running this 12 personnel, um, I think it's going to be really hard for Alabama unless they can get some of those really big chunk plays to, you know, kind of be in a position where they're like winning late. Yeah. And, and if Michigan, like Michigan's defense has to make Jalen Milrow throw the ball first, right? Like yeah, that has to, to be him. because they're, they're plays where they really do get explosive. And I'm not saying that Jalen Milrow isn't a great passing quarterback. Like he's been really good, especially in the back half of the year. But if you're going, you have to make him be a pass first weapon, because if he's going to run on you, like it's going to get ugly because you can't plan, you can't game plan for that. Well, right. Like we've seen, Mm -hmm. Like it's the Lamar Jackson like principle. It, it everything's fine when you know the ball is in front of you, but when when he fucking moves and he gets out of the pocket, like when he's where he is unscripted, that's where Jalen Milrose is most dangerous. I'm super excited for that. And then you you have to like like you said, this is this has to be if Michigan's going to win this game, you can't have explosive plays allowed on you defensively. That was what got them against TCU last year was those explosive plays. You got to limit them. Alabama isn't like they don't have a ton of explosive explosive plays, so it's not like this is going to be super super difficult to do. But like, if Michigan wants to win this game, it's got to be a field position battle. Let your offense work. Don't turn the ball over. Like a really good disciplined game. Um, yeah, and you know Alabama's like 
going to take their fair share of shots, right? Like yeah. they're going to have every now and then like a, a 40 yard seam route that they, you know, try to get these big plays. So yep. like, as you say, it shouldn't be that hard to do, but really it's in that specific moment. Are you the cornerback getting attacked in this situation going to make the play? That's what it's going to come down to. Because again, if we look at the end of the game and Michigan loses, we're probably going to look at like, wow, they lost because, you know, in the second quarter when they were up 10 to three and it was third and 11, Jalen Milrow, like, you know, found Isaiah Bond for like a 65 yep. touchdown. And it like, to like, then they got the ball to start the third quarter, blah, blah, blah. Um, so you just got to make sure that it's, it's a clock chew situation, um, which again, when you're running the ball that efficiently, shouldn't be that hard. Um, Alabama has been running the ball better down the stretch. So I'm yeah. it's definitely important to see what happens with Jason McClellan, McClellan here. Um, because, you know, he, he's kind of come into his own. They've been running pretty well behind that offensive line. Yeah, um, their secondary guys, Roydell Williams, I, like 5'10", 214. I don't – like I'm not seeing anything that's crazy for him. Like he's had a couple touchdowns in a couple games. He had a touchdown in the SEC Championship, 16 carries, 64 yards there, um, which is – that's where McClellan got banged up. But, like, he hasn't at any point this season had to carry the load. So, I, you know, hopefully McClellan plays, but, you know, we'll see. Um, and then outside of the Zinter issue, like, Michigan's healthy. So, um, that that's big. I, You know, you like to see the, the big guys playing in these games. Um, all right. It's, it's time. You got you to gotta do it. Nick, give me a prediction. What, how is this game going to unfold? Give me, give me kind of like a little bit of a story and a final score. Uh, yeah. So I do think that we're going to see Michigan come out with the lead. And I think that they're probably going to hold like a slight lead at half, uh, whether that's like a 10 to seven, like I do think it's going to be kind of low scoring. Um, but then I mean, I'm, I'm assuming it's going to be a close game. Like, I do think that Michigan does I, – I think they win this game, as I've said. Um, but I, by, I cannot close my eyes and picture a blowout by Michigan. Um, I just don't think they're explosive, explosive enough to do it. So I think that there's maybe a couple lead changes in the third quarter. Maybe Alabama goes up, like, uh, you know, 21-17, and it's in the fourth quarter or something like that. Um, but I, I think – I just trust that Michigan will have the lead at some point in the fourth quarter and will not give it up. Um, kind of just use that defense, stop Melrose, get them in like a third and long situation where they, you know, try to force it to someone um, incomplete, go for it on fourth down, don't get it. Michigan ends up winning. Little anticlimactic at the end because a lot of people are like, oh, we could see something crazy with Alabama here. Doesn't happen. Michigan wins 24 to 21. That's what I see. 24 to 21. Love it. Love it. That would be, I mean, that's a, that's the, that's like a Vegas dream. Like Michigan covers. It's, it's the over under pushes. Over under pushes. <laughs> like a, a really interesting um, situation. But I, I love that. Like I, I could see any of that happening for sure. Um, my prediction. Right. Um, I, I think the first half is going to be kind of a knockdown, slug it out, like not a lot of points, not a lot of turnovers. Um, going to be kind of like an anticlimactic first half for like, oh, this is the college football playoff and the score is 10-10 going into halftime. Like I, I think it'll be a close, you know, game going into the half. Um, I, I am like, I'm on the first half under for what for whatever it's worth. Um, I, I think coming out of halftime, I don't know if there's anybody in the country better at making halftime adjustments than Nick Saban. I, I think he makes, you know, an adjustment. Maybe there's a turnover, big play, special team, something. Alabama takes the lead. Um, Jay, I think that you you brought it up before. I think that cover seven is going to cause some issues for McCar J.J. McCarthy. Like, he has to make decisions against that cover seven defense because – what they show and what they do are not always going to be the same thing. So um, I, I think that causes him uh, some issues, maybe he throws a late turnover and Alabama scores. 
Um, so I'm going 27, 14, um, my, the, the under hits under 45 and we go, God damn it. Alabama is going to be playing for another national championship. Yeah. And again, uh, I can obviously see it happening. I don't feel as confident, um, about like the specifics, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, of the prediction in this game. Um, or even the winner for that for that sake. It's really just like me going Michigan is is more of just like come on for the yeah. sake of of just like getting it over with almost cuz like they're losing so many starters like if they don't do it now will they ever yeah, like I, all of the I, I mean, chaos that happened this year with that team in Harbaugh yeah, like, and you got to say like you said Alabama's been tested. Michigan's been tested in a completely different way, yeah. right? Like they've had Harbaugh missed six games. Their head coach has just not been on the sideline for half of their games. They've had the I mean, Connor Salian yeah. scandal. They had like everyone calling them proven cheaters, which is like did, true. Did you right? see, like, did you see the report that there's a, a one of the Alabama guys was like, yeah, we're we are only watching film as a team. We're not individually watching it on our iPads because of Michigan stealing signs. That was Isaiah Bond. Yeah, That's he said like sadly crazy. we can't we can't watch film like individually because like uh, they they steal signs, which is like That's like, crazy. Yeah. Um, and, and the thing is like yeah like this this all that drama it's not overblown by any means like Michigan definitely it, it was scandalous of them, but it's still for the players themselves like they it's not like they're you know in the thick of it yeah, right like yeah. they're they're there to fucking win the game and they're who really matters and i think that they've had to deal with a lot of this drama and they've still overcome it they have the one seed um i think they're probably hearing some of the doubters as well oh yeah right because oh, i do yeah. think that uh, I, I i don't know what the public betting percentage is but just based on what i've heard from people that know ball they're leaning alabama uh, for the most part. So like, I'm assuming Michigan's kind of hearing that as the, as the one seed, uh, you kind of get some doubt, but from your point of view, last time Alabama was like a four seed, they played number one seed Clemson and they kicked their ass. And then they ended up beating, uh, Georgia right on that two attack of Iloa yep. to Calvin Ridley, whatever it was. Um, maybe it was Devonte Smith. I don't remember. Yeah. It would have been Ridley. Ridley was caught by them, but yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Um, but yeah, so it's kind of like, like, you know, Clemson was a similar team that year where it was like the defense is the answer kind of thing. And it, it, like, I, I really do see it going either way, but uh, we'll just have to see. Very I'm so like, excited, man. We, 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 we talked about Florida State and all that drama, but like we got a great four teams, great two matches. I, I do think this year, as far as like any of these four teams could win it, and I say that with a better – you know, confidence in that than any other year in the history of the 14 playoff. Like I truly believe all four of these teams, if they play their best football, have a shot to win the national title. I completely agree. I think if you gave each team a percentage, there's a, a way that all of them have a percentage to win over 20%. Like yeah. where it's like 28% here, 25, 25, 22. Yeah. Like Something somewhere like between 30 and 20 for every team, I, I think is. Yeah perfectly reasonable which in years past like uh the lsu year yeah right where it's you're looking at oklahoma you're saying they probably right. have a three percent chance of winning yeah. the national championship game um and and even ohio state and clemson probably had pretty low chances lsu was probably like an 80 percent chance yeah um so yeah this year i mean it's great like i well, let's move on to Washington, Texas, because uh, I'll, I'll just continue yeah. my thought there after we talk about this. No kidding. Washington, Texas, 845 kickoff. So it's going to be a little late one. Um, we'll see. Love it. I mean, last year, the kick going through at midnight was just outstanding. Like, g heading off into the new to year. Some. just To some. It, well, <laughs> well, yeah, okay. Because it was, it was a bit, you know, of a, like, fucking chaotic mosh pit of shit happening, right? True. So, like you have a, people screaming, not even watching the game. You're trying to like find the TV at the wherever you're at. Yeah. Like, what you can't hear the audio. It was kind of just like here's the deal. My old man ass, I don't go out for fucking New Year's Eve anymore. All right, right. I just, like I, I was no. 22. Uh, you know, out out in Charlotte, North Carolina. So 
Uh, but it's still, I obviously I found a TV. I yeah. was able to do it. Um, and it was nuts because people like are like three, two, one, and they scream right <laughs> at the kick, is drifting it's left. And I was obviously with a ton of Georgia fans too that were starting to like they were barking. I was like, dude, oh my god, I hate you so much. I like my only time ever rooting for Ohio State in my life, probably. Um, craziness. Yeah. But yeah, so they, we're not going to get that this year because it's yeah. January 1st. Instead, I'm kind of thankful for it. Yeah, except for the fact that I have to fucking work the next day, which is going to <laughs> suck ass. Um, that does suck. That being said, this game is going to be awesome to watch. Um, Texas is a four point favorite. Washington is plus 150 on the money line. The total is is 63 and a half a dramatically different game um, than what they're expecting for Alabama, Michigan. Uh, Washington doesn't have any notable injuries outside of like stuff that happened early in the year, but we've known about that. Um, and then Texas, obviously Jonathan Brooks is out. He tore his ACL um, late in the regular season. Xavier Worthy is listed as questionable with a leg injury um, in the same way that um I saw with Jace McClellan. I don't think he's going to sit out. Like I, I don't see, um, you know, I don't see anything where he's saying that, you know, they that it, yeah, they don't like anticipate. it's actually pretty bad. Yeah. Or... So that being said, yeah, he has to play. Worthy has to play. Yeah. That would that would change things if he doesn't. I but... I agree. Um, this game is going to be fucking awesome. Quinn Ewers and Michael Penix. I would I would not be shocked if both of these team teams throw for like throw for three fifty ish like are both closing in on like five hundred yards of offense like I I think it's going to be an absolute shootout I cannot wait hundred percent I think this game will be the closest thing we've had to that uh, Georgia Oklahoma game with Baker versus like yeah. Sean Michelle and like all that um, that same year actually the the two a year. Uh, where it was like overtime, uh, 52 to 45, whatever it yep. was. I mean, you look at these teams and it's, you know, it, it just feels like the offenses are well-oiled machines as far as like the playmakers and the ability to yeah. like game plan for four weeks to like dr draft up these, these situational plays and to obviously like the first 15 plays is probably going to be scripted anyway. I think we're going to start out with a bang. I think it's just not going to let up. Um, I love the over. Oh, yeah. and a half is high, but like, man, uh, I love it. I'm not. I, I think we get to 90. <laughs> if you aren't betting the over in this game, what are you doing? You know what I mean? Like, that's that's just a vibe. Like, that, back to the vibes. That's just a vibe. Like, you can't feel <laughs> good about yourself betting the under in the last game. Like, not 845 kickoff night game college football playoff between two insane offenses and you're gonna bet the under Ew, dude. yeah you, you look, at, look in the mirror and and realize that you're taking it too seriously if yeah. you're gonna bet the under come on i don't care even if it hits you're lame for that yeah <laughs> because uh for it to hit i mean i'd be shocked it'd have to be like 31 28 like that that the only scenario i think it could hit is if it gets to like 60 but somehow not 64 right yeah. like there's no way it, it ends at like 40 seven not a shot right? like a 24 but no way yeah. and i think it, it could soar over so just playing your odds there yeah gotta go over give me some of the keys to victory for washington in this game because they are the underdog which some might think is surprising yeah and washington like obviously they they played a hell of a pac-12 schedule texas also played a hell of a schedule but it wasn't as difficult like down the stretch as washington's was um that being said they did the the college football awards and I was kind of surprised that they gave Washington the Joe Moore award for the best offensive line in the country. And I went back and I looked at, you know, what they've done running the football and what they've done in pass protection. Like there are only three teams in college football that let up less sacks than Washington this year. They, they were outstanding. Yeah. And I didn't realize just how good they were. And it, cause you always are like, you, I don't see Penix scrambling around and doing all sorts of shit. Like he's in the pocket throwing fucking darts. And that's going to be like, if you're going to win, you have to keep him upright. This game is going like that. I'm really excited to, as far as like matchups go, like 
Both of these teams have awesome wide receivers. Both of these teams have awesome quarterbacks. But like what might make the game is this awesome offensive line for Washington and Texas's front four. Because their front four is the best in the playoff. It's like that's the biggest difference between these Texas teams and old Texas teams. Like yeah. old Texas didn't have these guys. The this te- like Tavondre Sweat. That man is a fucking monster inside. He's a hoss. Byron Murphy? Yeah. He's a hoss. Um, those guys are the big boys on the inside, which is why it's been pretty hard to run on Texas uh, this year. Um, who, who I'm blanking on their safety, who's really good. Um, Cat- Catalan, maybe? Because uh... Uh, I, I feel like I read somewhere that may, like, Maybe he transferred or something. They have Baron, I, but I think is Baron a safety? I don't know. I have to look this up, which is this is poor podcasting. So yeah, sorry. it is. Um, <laughs> Jade Baron. Yeah, so I, I'm not seeing. So he is under at Spur, which I think is technically like a strong safety like the hybrid role. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which is interesting. It they they have like a, a decent secondary, but I do think that some of the guys might have like an injury here or there or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I, I remember reading. Well, something. and I didn't list it, but they have Watts listed on the injury report. Um, who's a corner for them? And they also have um, another corner listed on the injury report, but I don't think he is at. I don't think he gets nearly as many reps. Um, yeah. Jalen Catalan, their safety, entered the transfer portal. Which That's is crazy insane. Because he's he's he is really really good, and he's not going to be playing. Which is like, what are you doing? Yeah. Um. So that was that's kind of what it was, I think, for me. Um. Where I, I that that like confirmed it that this will just be like a offensive juggernaut type game because I feel less confident about the Texas secondary to be able to stop the Washington yeah. receivers. Just and no Texas, so Texas plays um, quarters, which is essentially like your corners go deep, your safeties go deep, each has a corner in the field, right? If you are going to exploit quarters coverage, what you need to do is you need to push the ball down the field, right? Um, to uh, Adunze, Jaden, uh, oh, what the hell is his name? Jalen yeah, Polk, Jaylen Polk and, Jaylen and, uh, McMillan. and McMillan, right? But what, how you exploit that is you get those wide receivers running vertically, you make those safeties move backwards, and then you hit somebody in the deep middle of the field. Like, that is how you attack that defense. That is the yeah. only reason, and I, I say this pretty, that is the only reason that Oklahoma beat Texas, is because Dylan Gabriel did that very, very well with Oklahoma's wide receivers. It it all just lined up perfectly for them. The bad news for Texas is the only team that might be better at it than Dylan Gabriel in Oklahoma is the team that they're playing in Michael Penix and Washington. Like they they've dominated that area of the field all year. Like Polk and Adunze have been outstanding um mcmillan has been good when he's healthy like uh, he hasn't been healthy all year but those two guys are awesome awesome and i I think that is what yeah i think that's what washington does i think they attack that deep middle of the field um the interesting like nobody's talking about washington's deep well nobody's talking positively about washington's defense um, I think they have a first round guy rushing the passer, if I'm not mistaken. Braylon, Braylon Trice. Yes. Trice, who I mean, he has five sacks on the year. He's been solid. Um if Washington is going to be Texas, they can't you can't get pressure against Quinn Ewers and not get home. Because Quinn Ewers has been outstanding against blitzes all year. Like you have to sack him because getting there and getting pressure isn't going to be good enough. Because like because what that means is, is you have Mitchell one-on-one or Xavier Worthy one-on-one. And those guys, fun fact, they fucking win those matchups a lot. So I, I'm excited to see like the what these teams are going to try to do to stop the other offense. I can't wait to watch. Because it, at so far, yeah. you haven't been able to. What I was going to say, so 
since that Oklahoma game, I feel like we've seen, uh, when you really look at it, some adjustments from Pete Kwiatkowski, yeah. who's the Texas defensive coordinator, and his scheme and his ways of like realizing where they're seeing deficits, where they've made mistakes. And I mean, we've seen it like Texas's defense has gotten better throughout the season to the point where like, like what you're saying with finding the deep middle, because Texas obviously, you know, plays quarters. Um, I think there's ways where you can use like what Saban normally does with Alabama, which is spying, right. Where we're, or, or sorry, having a, uh, it's like a facade, right. It's like you have the two, uh, high safeties, but you actually, yeah. like once the play is snapped, you go to single high and you have one of the safeties drop down into that deep middle, or you can have your two linebackers. You could have them show blitz, drop off one, one enters that, right? And if you can get home on pass rush and make Penix kind of think something's there while you're dropping some guy back into that deep middle, knowing that that is what they're going to see is open, I can see maybe some mistakes here and there from the offense in Washington. Like, I, I do think that I, I like Texas's defense a little bit more than I like Washington's as far as what I'm expecting from having this much time to game plan for it and looking at their own team's film throughout the season. Um, and that for me is like kind of the difference, right? Like I do think that we differ on this one as well. And it's probably a little bit defensively based yeah. in our reason. And that's the, the thing with this. And we've talked a ton about passing the, the football. We've hardly talked about these teams run games, um, Dylan, uh, Dylan Johnson, is that, that right? Dylan Johnson for Washington. He's, he has been phenomenal. He's a thousand yard rusher this year, like 14 touchdowns. He's been there. They don't have another running back on that team with over 200 yards rushing. And, and Johnson has a yeah. 1100, which, which is crazy. Um, obviously Brooks is hurt. So Baxter is going to be running it for Texas, I think you you will be able to run on these teams a little bit, so it'll be interesting to see how you know they balance that because it everything in me is like yeah let these quarterbacks sling it let them throw it but like you can't just drop back and pass pro as an offensive line all day like that you're you're gonna get your ass beat if you don't attempt to run the football so even though like if Texas is better at running the football than Washington is like that could end up like really hurting. Um, really hurting Washington's defense because if you have to defend both well like that's that's really hard to do I this game I've gone back and forth on this game so many times like I've always I felt pretty good about the Bama pick just because like in my brain it's just don't fucking bet against Nick Saban like you don't bet against Nick Saban it's yeah the logic points to yep and now it's like I they on this one it's like it Kalen DeBoer, Sark, like I, I don't think either, both have been outstanding coaches this year. Like I'm, I like Kalen DeBoer a little bit better, but both of these teams have just been so damn good. So damn Yeah. Good. And, and both of them are like fresh, like obviously Washington's been to the college football playoff, but that was with Jake Browning and a completely different head coach. Yeah. Like a, it was a totally different system seven years ago. Texas never been in it. So these two teams are like, like fresh and ready to go and prove themselves. Uh, whereas Alabama and Michigan are kind of like, like seasoned a little bit more as far as playing in. Yeah. The and that's game. the other thing too, is like the, for Bama, Michigan, like those teams have been there. Like the Pat, I, I, Bama didn't make it last year, but like those teams have been to the college football playoff. Neither of these teams have yeah. like, is that going to show up in and, in like the nerves or you know whatever? Like, I don't know. Well, I think so. If they were if they were playing like if it was Bama versus Washington yeah. and Texas versus Michigan, I think we would maybe see some differences there. But I think it worked out pretty beautifully for us that we get to see two teams yeah. that are brand new to it. Because I don't, I think that relieves a lot of the pressure. Where like you're going to see if if we do see mistakes, it's probably going to be kind of from yeah. both sides in similar ways or we might just see like both teams kind of like free of all the pressure of the situation just playing beautiful football which is what obviously we yeah, want to see for sure so nick lay it on me i know i know i know that we differ on this game but uh 
Give give yeah. me your give me your uh, story uh, of the Sugar Bowl. Yeah, and I, and I, I do think this game is pretty easy to predict as far as um, the fact that it it should be very close and it should have a lot of points, right? I feel pretty confident in saying that. Um, but like as far as picking a winner, what it comes down to is who makes more of those big plays. We were kind of touching on it a little when we, you know, we're talking Bama, Michigan. Each team has probably like five opportunities per game to switch the tides, right? To like completely change the outcome, those coin flip plays. And it's impossible to predict in that hyper-specific context what's going to happen. But if I'm going to trust anyone in this situation, I think it's going to be Texas's defense I trust a little bit more than I do Washington's defense. And so with that being said, I do think Texas's defense will make a big play or two that will make the difference. Uh, maybe, you know, in the second half when we're going, like, you know, Alabama LSU, how that was like such a back and forth, mm -hmm. like the first punt is going to be the like sign of who loses the game. And obviously Jane Daniels got hurt, but like it was still probably that situation. I don't think I think it's kind of going to be like that, but maybe we see Penix throw an interception like late in the third when Texas is up three and Washington. It's like their turn to go retake mm -hmm. the lead, but they don't. And Texas gets the ball and they go up, you know, 10 uh, going into the fourth. And then we're seeing like, is Washington going to be able to come back and win this game down 10 in the fourth? Um, and they get close, but they just can't make enough stops to do it um and texas ends up taking it 45 40 hell yeah hell yeah god that, i that would be that would be a tremendous game like i that would be a, a yep. tremendous tremendous football game um i i am i'm taking washington texas texas has been outstanding all year right dominant defensive front like their wide receivers and their weapons have been outstanding quinn ewers has gone from being the number one recruit ever at Ohio State, then transferring to Texas. Didn't have a phenomenal year last year. Everybody's like, "Oh, is Texas ever going to be back?" And this year they are back. They're back in the. They're in the national championship contention, and all of that against Michael Penix, who has been discounted and given up on. Time and time again, he was given up on in Indiana, and now he's in Washington doing phenomenal things with Kalen DeBoer and what this Washington team can do. I think th this game is going to be a whoever has the ball last may well win it. And you know what? I think that's going to be Washington. I think it's going to be an outstanding game, 42-38, like a, an 80-point performance between these teams. I, I can't wait. I This, this game yeah. – but both of these games, I am just super, super excited for. Like, I really, I have no idea who's going to win the national championship. And I fucking love that. Yep. Which, uh, and another thing I wanted to say about this Texas-Washington matchup is like, when, like, we have had times where Pac-12 teams, Big 12 teams, they make the playoffs. Like, normally it was Oklahoma mm -hmm. and Washington's made it, Oregon's made it, blah, blah, blah. But rarely have we seen a big 12 team or a pac 12 team in the actual championship. Yep. Like it's normally they, they make it as the four seed and yeah. they lose. That's just yeah. what has happened. And so now we're going to get to see one of these conferences represented in the biggest game, which is crazy. Um, and and pack the pac 12 done it before. And for Texas having, you know, like you said, they're kind of back now. Um, it, to me, it just makes a little more sense for this to be the Big 12's opportunity to do it. Uh, last year, the you know, 14 playoff, they've literally never had – well, I, I, they had TCU, but um, that was yeah. crazy. <laughs> um, and I, I don't know. It just feels that way to me. It, it, and it's also what you're saying. Like, like, I feel like Texas has a lot of these guys that were, you know, heralded as great prospects – Whereas Washington has guys that they've kind of homegrown and developed into being great players. You could go either way on, on the argument of it. But for me, I kind of trust like 
the guys that were supposed to be better probably have a little more of that intangible uh, ability. Um, so, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of like little intricacies that could, that could turn this little statistics, little reasons that could, you could argue about all day long. And, and obviously we differ here on both games. Yep. Um, but I do think both uh, championships would be electric as well. Yep. So absolutely cannot wait. So that being said, um, we'll be back to do a national championship preview next week. Um, and we'll talk about, you know, whoever wins these games, super excited for that. We'll, we'll break it all down. Um, then uh, we'll have to get into some college hoops, but man, I am. And we'll recap, you know, the new year, six bulls, all that stuff. Get ready. Got to recap. We'll recap the, uh, the game. Yeah. Bowl. Noon sharp yep. tomorrow. Don't miss yep. it. Go Tigers. Go Tigers. Yeah. A couple, couple really good games. Yeah. So we'll, we'll touch on it. Um, for sure. Week. For sure. Wanted to focus, yeah, on on college football playoff only today. Yep. Really. So that being said, like and subscribe, do all those things. Uh, follow us on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, all that stuff, um, and we'll see you in the next one.